This is Peter Connor. I'm director of the Barnard College Translation Center, and I'm joined today by Lynn Sharon Schwartz, who is a novelist, an essayist, a poet, and a translator. Thank you for joining us, Lynn. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, we might begin by talking about some of your translations. There are two primarily, uh, Liana Milou and Natalia Ginsberg, both Italian writers. Uh, could you speak a little bit about how you came to the first project, Smoke Over Birkenau by Liana Milou? Yes, uh, I had just finished a novel. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was called, Le it was Leaving Brooklyn, which was, came out in 1989. And as usual, when I finish a novel, I was at very loose ends. I didn't know what to do next, and I thought I had nothing to write about. Uh, I thought I was written out. I, I think that periodically. Uh, and I thought it would be wonderful to do a translation. I had done translations before, but not commercially. I had translated some of the works of Natalia Ginsburg uh, and just done them to help me learn Italian. So I asked around, and it happened that an Italian friend of mine, a professor at the University of Florence, knew that the Jewish Publication Society in Philadelphia had this book called Smoke Over Birkenau. It was called Il Fumo di Birkenau, The Smoke of Birkenau. Uh, and was looking for a translator. So he brought us together, and I did a sample. And I, my Italian at the time was, uh, it was not bad. It, it was good for practical purposes, and I could read. But it really wasn't what it should have been to do a translation. So I knew I'd have to work extra hard, but I was willing to do that. So I was asked to do a five-page sample. As, and this sample took me two weeks, which is a long time for a translator to work on five pages. But I looked up many words, and I, I worked very hard. And finally, I got the job, and it took me many months to do the book. It took me about eight months. It was a book of, oh, 180 or so pages. Uh, so that's how I got into it, and I, I loved doing it, even though it, the subject matter was very, very grim. I didn't love that. But uh, I loved the act. I, I found that it was, it was very much like writing, and I, I like writing. Uh, many writers don't really like to write. They like to have written. But I do actually like the act of writing. But at the moment, at that time, I had nothing I wanted to say. So it was like writing, but the best thing was I didn't have to make anything up. It was all done. It was all there. All I had to do was find the proper words. And as I think I said somewhere, you know, even writing is a form of translation. Everything. There's a new book out, you probably know it, by David Bellows about yes. translation. And Is that a fish in your ear? Yes, and he says, I just finished reading it recently, he says somewhere that uh, he, everything in the world is translation. He manages to put it all under that rubric. But there's, a, there's something to that. I mean, trans, writing is a form of translating sort of inchoate feelings or thoughts in the mind into proper language. Anyhow, uh, here I didn't have to have any thoughts or feelings of my own. All I had to do was play with the words, which is the part I like the best. I actually am more interested in the words than the thoughts behind them. So I enjoyed doing it very much, and I learned, I learned how to do it. That's interesting what you say about the words, because I know you've written an essay concerning the experience of translating this work, uh, an essay called Found in Translation. And there you describe uh, how you found in your Ita Italian edition of that work by uh, Liana Milou, lists of words. Uh, w uh, what was the purpose of those lists? Well, yes, in, in that essay I, uh, I keep, I repeat those words which appear periodically in the essay. Uh, they, they appear random and mysterious, why are they there? And then you realize after a while that these, essay, these words become, are used at various points in the essay. But uh, yes, in the first, uh, when you open the book, there are these words. And I couldn't remember when I opened the book years later, what are these words doing here? They were words that I think I just liked, and I had hoped to find a place to use them in, in the translation. Of course, I wouldn't force one where it didn't belong, but they were not, not very arcane words, but a little bit offbeat. I mean, there was a word, rancid was one of them. You know, not a word you use every day, but we all know what it means. Uh, lots of words, and I, I, words that I was thinking about at the time and that I hoped to find a place for in the translation. And often I did. 
that I think I read somewhere, I think it may have been Henry Miller who wrote in such a fashion that say he had a list of words uh, in front of him uh, that uh, would be incorporated into the day's writing material. Uh, these words, are, were they suggested by the reading of the original? That's just, there's some relation between the words and the Italian edition of Milu in which they're inscribed on the first page. I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I can't say for sure. I don't remember. But I think they were just words I came across or thought about. Um, we don't have the book. Uh, anyway, I, I don't... Um, no, I don't think they were suggested by the, by the book. I think they were just words <laughs> that but I would jot down. Case, I didn't write them all at once. Well, in any case, you used all these words in the essay found in translation. And that points to the, uh, to the intimate uh, relation between the act of translating and the act of writing that you were saying. Because right, you did translate the book by Milou, but that uh, experience also generated some, well, an essay. Uh, with all these words listed as part of that essay, because as I think you say somewhere else that as an essayist, you're quite uh, your essays tend towards fiction, and your fiction also tends towards the essayistic. And so, in that uh, that essay that you wrote about translating, found a translation. The presence of these words is the is the uh, signature of the fictional in a way. Yes, yeah, they don't tend toward fiction in the sense that they, you know I don't make things up and pretend that they're true I, as some writers do. I don't do that. But I, when I write them, I think of them as having a shape of fiction. You know, in a way, manipulating the reader, where am I going to take him or her next, and what do I want him or her to feel? Uh, but that's interesting what you said about Henry Miller. I didn't I didn't. I hope that. I'm right. Yeah. I could be making it up. <laughs> we'll check that later on. Well. We'll have the, uh, the, the fact checkers look at that. Uh, uh, there's also another fictional offshoot of this uh, translation, which is to say the story of Francesca. Francesca, uh, well, Francesca came about, uh, yes, I describe um, how I was working on a translation and needed uh, needed help with it, and I, I found, the person I found, a young Italian woman who would help me, I called her my translation therapist, I would bring in things that I, or idioms or things that, because I have not, I, well, I lived in Italy actually for a year at one time, but things that not being Italian, I just didn't know. And it turned out, because she had an unusual name, uh, that she was the daughter of people I had known in Italy many years ago. In fact, I had babysat for her. She was then about, she was young, she was about 24 years old when she helped me. And I thought, uh, what a what a remarkable coincidence, and I told her, you must be so-and-so's daughter, isn't that amazing? And she kind of shrugged and said, yeah, so you know my parents. So to her it was nothing, as uh, that was proper. So what interested me about that encounter was the fact that one, one discovery could mean so much to one half of the, one interlocutor and nothing much to the other. And I liked the idea and I wanted to play with that. So, um, so I wrote a story called Francesca in which a man um, discover he he has he's a teacher and a young Italian student comes to him and he he realizes that it's his daughter somebody he a daughter he never knew he had he she was conceived during an affair when he was in Italy uh, because he doesn't tell her this but the fact he does tell her that he knew her parents which means nothing to her or very little that he they were hosts to American students and it means everything to him so I wanted that. Uh, comparison and in addition, I, I called the story and the young woman the story Francesca because uh, I had an Italian and French teacher, somebody I used to go to whenever I was going to travel to Italy or France and felt I needed a little brush up before, and we would have a few hours of conversation so he could get me ready for my trip. It was a lovely man. His name was Francesco. Well, his name wasn't Francesca, but I call him that in the essay. And I called Francesca became the name of the character in the story. So this doing this translation led to a lot of other works. It kind of was like a, a root that sprouted in my mind and various tendrils came out of it. And maybe still will. Perhaps still will. Well, it, there's also the poem that I, I have to mention that uh, uh, a poem came up this experience also. 
Yes, well... From research that you conducted in relation to carrying out the translation at the Evo Institute. Right, uh, yes, when I learned... I had to go to the Evo Institute for some some data about the camps, and there I learned uh, that the various prisoners... Uh, political prisoners, Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, gays, and there was one other category, um, criminals, that each one had to wear a, a different color armband. The Jews were special because they had a yellow star. And this, I thought of it as a, a, what I call in the poem a rainbow coalition. Uh, so, And I, I said in the essay that someday I will write a poem using those colors. And then uh, later on I did... And then uh, there's the Natalia Ginsberg work, and uh, I can't help but notice that the two important translation projects uh, that ha- have defined your cr- career are both uh, non-fictional works. Yes, I think that I think it's coincidental. I don't, I don't think I, I would gladly have translated a Ginsberg novel, but it wasn't available to me. In fact, I did. I, I translated a novella called Familia, Family. And uh, by the time I got it ready to try to publish, somebody else had done it and got there first. So I just loved Ginsberg and wanted to translate anything I could. And I, I, most of her fiction had been translated when I got around to this, but her essays mainly had not. There was one group of essays, the uh, first called Les, Les Picots Les Virtus, uh, The Little Virtues, that had been translated, but she had two other marvelous collections that I don't think it had been translated at all. So I put together a, a selection from the three. In addition to one a long piece at the back of the book, she did a, a, a short book uh, relating to an adoption case in Italy uh, involving a child called uh, Serena Cruz. Uh, it was an involved case. Uh, and she was, she was indignant about the way it had been handled. It was an adopted child who, for reasons of bureaucracy and improper filling out of forms at three years old was taken away forcibly from her adoptive parents because they hadn't done it properly. And Ginsburg was uh, incensed, and the case was a cause celebre in Italy. So I translated that uh, in a shortened form, uh, not because of me, but because of the publisher, and that's in there with the essays. But no, I, I would happily do her fiction I have. I did do a book of fiction, a children's book, called uh, Al- Aldabra, or The Tortoise Who Loved Shakespeare, by a wonderful author called Silvana Gandolfi. Uh, so I did that. That was fiction. I see. And uh, what, is there a particular attraction for, for you uh, to Ginsburg, uh, or even to Ginsburg and to Milu? Is there something that conjoins them? They're both women authors. They're both women who have faced uh, persecution uh, in different contexts, Uh, um, uh, Ginsburg being uh, uh, a well-known anti-fascist and having suffered personal consequences in her life because of anti-fascism. This is an aspect that appeals to you? It does. When you put it like that, and in retrospect, yes, and they were both Jews, although Ginsburg, I think, at the very end of her life, converted... I don't know why. And Milou was not an observant Jew. She didn't didn't really know she was was not very aware that she was a Jew at all until the Germans made her aware. Um, Yes, I think when you put it that way, that is one reason they appealed to me. But I don't think it was (laughs) conscious at the time. It was not premeditated. Uh, They're very different. Uh, Ginsburg is is a great artist, a great stylist, and I... I just love everything about her sensibility. She's one of these authors I you, you fall in love with. If everybody has a couple, and she is the one for me. Uh, the style is very simple, and yet the thinking is complex. She's direct. It's very limpid, and she herself, as a matter of fact, uh, translated Proust. And she always said she said somewhere, and I may mention this perhaps in my introduction, that. She wanted. She loved Proust and wanted to write that way, and long, sinuous, complex sentences. And she, and she said, "But when she sat down to write, what came out was as thin and dry as a bone." <laughs> so you really can't help what you write. Uh, I don't write 
very much like my, my work is not thin and dry as a bone, nor is it like Proust. But uh, when I read her, I feel uh, she has found the perfect medium for for her sensibility. She has found the perfect language, and that's why finding the perfect language, the idiom in English, was such a wonderful task. I wanted her to sound in English the way she sounds in Italian, if, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you've written in another place about uh, a temptation you had, I think, when you were younger, to copy out books, which you didn't always give into. But I think you copied out a little bit of of Little Women, for example. And so you, I did. <laughs> you had the impulse to copy out other books, which I think is very interesting to want to copy out books: uh, Tolstoy, Margaret Ravel, William Maxwell, uh, Calvino, for example. Uh, which is a little like wanting to have written them, and translating is a little bit like copying out, uh, it seems to me. That it, it, there's something in there, I'm trying to find the genesis of the translator in you. That, that's fascinating. I think you're right. I did want to copy those books. I did copy a good bit of Little Women, about 10 or 20 pages, when I was eight. But yes, um, I, with the Ginsberg, I almost feel like I own it. I have to remind myself that I didn't write this, but I, I wish I had written it. There are, there are lines that express perfectly what I have thought and felt. It's almost as if how did she, how did she know? It's truly a, a spiritual marriage. We have at least it's a one-sided feeling. Uh, yeah, so it's the, it's the way it's a way of possessing a work that you love. Now, the, it, it was not the same with Emilou. Uh, she's, she's a fine writer, but she's not a great artist. She's, she's a journalist and had a distinguished career in, after she got out of the camps when she was in her mid or late 20s. She was there not very long, about a year, a year and a half, perhaps less. But um, and she, uh, she went on to, she wrote several novels, and, but mostly was a journalist and went around doing, giving a lot of talks about... Um, her experience and about how to avoid similar terrible experiences like that. Uh, so her writing is more functional. She tells a good story. It's hard to tell whether the, there are five or six episodes in her book. And I was never totally sure whether they were fiction or, not, or memoir. And I, I met her once, but I never asked. I seemed somehow indiscreet. And what did it matter? Uh, either if they were fiction, they were based on experience. Uh, and in that case, because she was not a, a great writer or a beautiful writer, just a, a good writer with a lot to say, I had a, an experience I never had with Ginsburg. I wanted to make it better. I knew that I could make it more beautiful. I could make it, I could kind of dress it up, you know, ornament it. And I had to restrain myself. I'm just the translator. I'm just the transmitter. I don't have a right to do this. So in that sense, while in the, with the Ginsburg, it was the experience was freeing because I felt a part of myself was flowing into it. With the Milou, uh, it was limiting because I felt I, I had to be loyal to her. I could not indulge or uh, let my feelings spill over the page, especially with an experience like hers. I mean, you know, which has to be respected, uh, even if I could make her prose prettier. I have to remember what she went through is very important, and it's important that it be recounted the way she wants it to be recounted. You sound like a very uh, resp responsible translator with a, uh, a great deal of respect for the original, even if that comes at a certain cost to yourself, having to restrain impulses to, uh, uh, to embellish upon the material that you're working with. Uh, that's uh, surely commendable. It, some, somehow it makes me think of something you have written about having been brought up as a, as a good girl. <laughs> uh, that you're, you're, you're a very well-behaved translator. Oh, well, I guess I am, but uh, I'm wondering as you say this, I mean, I, this sounds very naive. Are there translators who, who don't? I mean, are there translators who want to embellish and they just go ahead and embellish? Yes, there uh, are. Aren't they, aren't they afraid they'll be f <laughs> <they're> <laughs> afraid they'll be found out? No, there are many, and they tend frequently to be also writers in their own right. Mm. That they uh, license themselves on the basis of their 
their own uh, very pronounced aesthetic sensibility to make certain changes to the original. Hmm. This is this is very common, and one one might have expected it in your case, but in your case, there seems to be a, a divorce between your translation work and the place of translation in your fictional work, which is considerable, and which we might talk about now, in fact, because your most recent publication uh, is a collection of poems called See You in the Dark, uh, where translations play a very important part. So I'm interested in, in what appears to be, uh, th it, these appear in some ways to be distinct practices for you, or have dis distinct protocols. Yes, well, definitely, but, uh, but I think as a writer I'd be honorable to I mean, I, it, it, and it's not, uh, the kind of good girl I was, as you referred to, is a different kind of good. It was more, you know, conforming or doing what was expected of me and not getting out of line, which I, I, I still, I can still behave that way, but I, I always wish I didn't. But this is a different kind of being good, since you used that word. It's, it's, a, it's a respect. For you. The, these writers whom I'm translating, they're writers like me. I, I have to, you know, we have a common goal and a common humanity. I wouldn't want it done to me, and so I won't do it to them. I think if I didn't like a work, if I felt a work was so much in need of embellishment, uh, I wouldn't do it and let somebody else do that. Uh, no, and it's sort of this, well, it's, it's, you know, I grew up in a time when, when art or writing was, was, there was a, it had a kind of a sanctity, I know it sounds a little pompous, but uh, there's a religious uh, tone to it, and there's the sanctity of the work, of the work of art, that it has to be itself. You know, it, I, I know this doesn't prevail now, but I we felt it couldn't be changed. There was a time when I never liked to go to see movies made of books I had loved, because how could you... I've, I've changed, I realize. This is we're in a different era, and we have had modernism and postmodernism and all the rest, and things mutate and I, I, I'm not as much of a purist as I was but I do think when you're in translation I, I would be a purist this is what the author wrote my job is to deliver it as best as I can Well you mentioned that uh, a moment ago that writing is itself a form of translating I think that is very evident in See You in the Dark mm -hmm. I'm thinking obviously of the poem by Verlaine uh, Shrink Shrinking Verlaine as you call it, where you reproduce the original poem in French, the famous, his most famous poem, Il pleure dans mon coeur, uh, and then uh, translate it serially and more economically each time. So there's a kind of a reduction in the culinary sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. it's more. Yes, that's, that's very <laughs> right. Yes, very good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also becomes, uh, he didn't intend it to be funny, but um, I, I know this is being uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for uh, well I'll find it uh, heretical or, uh, but if you read that poem often enough it really becomes almost a self parody you know it's, it's, it's a weeping it's melancholy and the melancholy is carried out you know, well you know the poem very well so uh, the more I read it the more I thought oh come on you know get off it get a life <laughs> and the, my translations well uh, became more and more infused with parody. But, you know, parody is a form of tribute. Uh, so it, it's that, too. I mean, that the poem, which I read in college for the first time, could have such a hold on me that when I wrote a book, you know, 45 years later, I still remembered it enough to want to play with it in this way is in itself a tribute. Uh, and you also include some catullus? Yes, and that, that's kind of not being a good girl, because I, I don't even know Latin. Um, but I, I, you know, I looked at other translations of these two poems, and I, from the languages I know, I could figure out what each word meant. And actually, I was reading a, an article about translators of Catullus, and these two that I use are among his most famous. And the, the translations were reproduced, and I didn't really think they were so good. I looked at them, and I thought, gee, I, I can do better. And so I tried. Well, that's because you're a writer. <laughs> and that's precisely what I was saying, that uh, in some instances writers uh, uh, believe themselves to be possessed of a particular power of expression that, uh, that transcends or trumps the original text. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that you... But, but you do things differently. 
Yeah, but I didn't think I would have I to improve on no, Catullus. I understand. But I, I can, can improve, improve on these other translations of Catullus, and that's surely perfectly legitimate, which may have been uh, produced by scholars or uh, someone with less literary sensibility than you have. Uh, I'd like to invite you, because we ought to also hear the poetic word rather than just talk about it today, uh, would you like to read a poem from See You in the Dark? Certainly. I can read one that has to do with translation uh, well, itself. I think that would be a wonderful choice. Okay. Is this Yes. Uh, this is called Untranslatable. Little Greek fish with no name, you came in a mound on a platter, fried, succulent, praised by the waiter in that cafe on the beach, Aegean water lapping under the moon. We tried all the names we knew of small fish, sardines, anchovies, smelts, herring, minnows, but he kept shaking his head, no English name. In Greek, he shrugged, we call them little fish. Little fish, size of minnows but not minnows, Fish as fine as you deserve a name. When I want to revive that summer night, the soft air on our skin, the skimming surf, the stars, the shiny fish we ate with our fingers, a savory, garlicky, fishy flavor, I want a word. Without a word, memory's a cloud I can't slide my hand around. Little fish, how did you glide so nimbly past the translators? It's a lovely poem, Thank and it's you. a lovely idea, uh, surely, that there should be something untranslatable, that not everything is translatable. Yes, but, and also uh, that without a word, I, the speaker, <laughs> or I, am left... Uh, I need the word for the experience. It's almost Proustian, you know, to, to need a, a hook, or well, in his case, it's a sensory thing, but something to, to bring it all back. A word would do that, but I don't have a word. However, in the poem, obviously, it contradicts itself because I do bring those feelings back. I like the idea, or it strikes me, that the poem is protecting the little fishes in their own <laughs> translatability, uh, precisely uh -huh. because you cannot find the, the name and will not find the name, or maybe there is no name. Uh, and, and fish are notoriously difficult in terms of finding the exact equivalent yeah. I think I think David Bellis mentioned this. It's a phenomenon that the linguists call imperfect matching. That, that they never quite match. So when you order a fish that you think you know, you know what you're ordering, it's always something slightly different. <laughs> so this is an extreme case where there simply isn't the word, and they're just little fishes. It's very lovely. Oh, and I like your idea that, that, that protecting them from from the translators. Yes. I sometimes find the argument that everything is translatable very uh, threatening or menacing. Uh, so everything can be ground in this translation machine and come out in some other way. Mm. Uh, so I like to think of your little fish as resist resistors, <laughs> uh, assisted by yeah. the poet, <laughs> yeah. uh, in a world where uh, increasingly everything is placed in this relation of infinite uh, 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 trans translatability. Well, actually, it really is if you go to Google translations. Yeah. Some of them are very funny. You know the kind of mistakes they make or the machine makes. But yes, they, it does have that attitude. It's a me mechanistic view of language. Mm -hmm. uh, we're coming close to the end of our time. Uh, I'd just like to ask you one last question. I know that travel occupies a very important place in your work. You're very interested in the foreign, in the exotic. You're very interested also in the local. Your, your novel, Leaving Brooklyn, is very much about the two, in a way, about, uh, the familiarity of your surroundings when you were a child and, and leaving those, what it would mean to leave those. Uh, I noticed also that the, the Natalia Ginsberg, which is not only your translation but your edition, you selected these essays, has the very lovely title, A Place to Live. And I just wanted to ask you, have you found a place to live? Well, I... Uh Literally, yes. I've lived in the same neighborhood for about 40 years. But I, do, I hope we have time to, ex to say a word about that title. Um, the first essay in that book uh, is in Italian. It's called La Casa. And in Italian, La Casa means the house. But it could also mean the apartment. It can mean anywhere you live. You know, if you live in an apartment, you call it your casa. Um, 
And the essay is, a, as in Ginsburg, very witty, but also poignant. She's, she's a witty woman. It's about her and her husband's search for an apartment in Rome, and they have such different tastes that whatever they find, they can't agree. So it's, it becomes a long, involved process, but it's also the analysis of their marriage and relationship. It's a wonderful essay. So, But it's called La Casa. Now, if I translated it, the house, that would be wrong in English because in English, a house is, you know, a house. It's not an apartment. It's a building when you, like, it's detached. So I couldn't say the house, but if I translated the apartment, first of all, it recalls that Jack Lemmon yes, movie. Does, very much so. <laughs> and uh, then it, it's not that there, it just didn't seem right. It's not enough. La casa in Italian, it, it means a place to live. It doesn't mean a house, an apartment, a cell, a, a, a lair, or whatever you live. So I thought of that, and I thought it was a little bit of a, you know, taking a liberty. I mean, la casa, her, I, it's just two words. I mean, basically, it's one word, la, it's nothing. And I made it four words, uh, and I broadened it. But I, I thought, this is right. This just feels right. Because that's what it's about. The place to live, not only where she and her husband could both agree that they want to live there, but the place to live with him in, in their difference and find common ground, so to speak. Absolutely. It's about human relations, which is another uh, title and preoccupation from that book. And uh, as you mentioned in your own preface, uh, uh, it's about what Ginsburg calls the long and inevitable parabola. We have to travel to feel, at last, a bit of compassion. A, a lovely phrase. Well, that's one of those sentences that make me feel, you know, I should have written that, so, but now I have, in a way, you know, I've put it into English, yeah. Now you have. I think that's a lovely way to end our discussion today. Uh, Lynn Schwartz, thank you very much for joining us. Thank um, you. It's been a pleasure.